Hey there everyone, it's Marla. Welcome to another video teaching going along with first and last. This is a Bible study which we've been taking a look at the books of the Bible in chronological order from first to last and we've been paying special attention to the first chapter and the last chapter of each one of the books. For today's teaching we're on book 30 in our chronological study and this book has actually been interesting because what I've found is that the first chapter and the last chapter really do support one another regarding the, the thrust or the theme of the book. What we saw in the first chapter is that Paul is writing this book to the Corinthian church because he's upset He's heard a report that there's division springing up among the people of the church and that division is really about who's better because they've been taught by Paul or they've been taught by Peter or they've been taught by Jesus or they've been taught by Apollos and there's just this spirit of division within and Paul is telling them to be very very careful about this this idea that they're not displaying love within the church and how we have come to know that that is going to be something that destroys the witness of Jesus and destroys people from coming to see the Father because all they see is division within the church and then they say well why would I want to join that we talked about this in the in the written teaching on Monday and uh, just pointing to the fact that you know we see denominations of Christianity and they are doing the same thing believing that their way is the right way and this is just a terrible witness for Christ when people from the outside people who are non-believers see the Christian church infighting it really does not represent the father well and it leaves it so that people don't want to come to know the Lord it's just it, it's you know it makes a, a terrible draw to become a Christ follower when you see that we can't even agree with am among ourselves about Christianity so anyway we, we saw that all rolling out in the first chapter of first Corinthians and what's cool is the last chapter of first Corinthians we see Paul and how he is displaying this loving nature, this unifying nature, uh, in the way that he has made relationships. And that's where I say it's sort of a bookends. You see Paul giving this instruction, don't divide. And then in the last chapter, we see how unifying Paul actually is. Now within 1 Corinthians, we, we have an instruction from Paul himself. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse one says, be imitators of me as I am in Christ. So Paul is not saying this in a prideful way. He's saying, look at what I do. I'm mature in the faith. I'm spiritually mature. Don't be uh, immature and in fight about who's better within the church. Be like me, be unifying, be loving, be gracious to all who are within the, the church of Jesus. So. I'm just going to dive right into chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians and hopefully within it you're going to see how Paul himself displays this unifying oneness, this characteristic of just, just being a, uh, somebody that keeps contacts, keeps connections within the body as a way to display the love of the Father. So let's read 1 Corinthians. We'll start in chapter one, and as always, I'll just talk as I'm going along, and, and we'll just see the heart of Paul. He loves the Corinthian church, and he just wants them to love in the way that he loves, um, specifically to the saints. So 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. So here Paul is instructing the people of the first Corinthian church to take up a collection on the first day of the week. So take it up on Sunday and put that aside as an offering to the other saints. Specifically, we're gonna see the saints in Jerusalem. So by this time, the believers who are in Jerusalem are being persecuted, mainly by the Jewish uh, leadership. And so Paul is telling the other churches 
uh, you see, he told the Church of Galatia this, and he's saying, as I told Galatia, I'm also telling you, take up, take up a collection, but don't do it while I'm there. Do it on the first day of the week. Do it in your Sunday gathering um, so that you don't do it while I'm there. Now, Paul is saying this because he wanted nothing to do with this, and we see this throughout Paul's writing that he is very quick to say that he did not depend on anybody else to support him in his missional work. Now, it's not that Paul is saying that it's wrong to get support. Obviously here he's saying, take a collection. We're gonna send it back to the saints in Jerusalem. But he is very proud to say that he is supporting himself. And we saw in the first chapter that he did this along with Priscilla and Achilla who he talks about again here in chapter 16, uh, he did this through tent making. Now, something that might be in your mind, you might have known that Paul is a tent maker, but if you're like me, you, you maybe thought, why was Paul a tent maker? He was a Pharisee. He was well-educated. He obviously was in the elite st status. Why was he also a tent maker? It, it seems like a conundrum. Is he a blue-collar worker or is he elite teacher? Well, the, the fact of the matter is it's both. In the Jewish culture, they still, to this day, pride themselves on every single um, oldest son of the family being taught a trade. No matter how smart, no matter if you're going on to become a rabbi, they are also taught a trade. And it's just, it, it makes sense, it's wisdom. You have something that you can support yourself with. So isn't that a great teaching, something that I think we should still be teaching our children that okay, it's great, go to college, do this and that, but also have a skill, have a trade, have a craft, have something that you can do no matter where you go to support yourself. And this is why we see Paul having this skill as a tent maker. He was able to do this as he went along his missionary journeys to support himself and not have to ask others for support. In this way, he separated himself um, out. He wasn't obligated to anybody and we can see it here same thing with the first Corinthian with the Corinthian church. He, he didn't want to have anything to do with the collection. He didn't even want to be around when they were doing it. That's how much he wanted to be able to say I came and shared of myself without asking for anything. He didn't want to be obligated to anybody. He, he just wanted to go out there and spread the love of God, spread the gospel message without any, any encumbrance. And isn't that amazing that he did that and he did it successfully considering how far he journeyed. If you look at you know how far he went in his journeys from, from Macedonia all, all through you know, the Turkish area and all through Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, he really he did a lot of journeying and he supported himself the whole way. So here we see Paul encouraging them to take up a collection for the saints who are being persecuted. Now, here we see that tie. You're going, you're going to want to, as a believer, make your offering. And part of that offering has to go to supporting other saints. So a lot of times people have, you know, they have, they have a problem with the tithe and they say, well, that was maybe it's an Old Testament thing and maybe we're not supposed to do that and I don't want to be forced to do it. God doesn't force anybody to tithe. <laughs> you know, it is not the way our, our Lord works. Uh, but here we see all over and specifically here in 1 Corinthians that we should be offering of ourselves. We should be giving of ourselves, not only to the local church, but to support other saints in their missionary work, especially if they are struggling and suffering, like we see that was going on here in Jerusalem. The, the believers there were being persecuted, so offerings were being taken up to send out to other churches, and that's how we show love to the family of God. We support them, we see if they're suffering, if they're struggling, and we support them. Uh, my prayer today, uh, for many of you also who are praying the same, is that somehow we can get our support to the church who is suffering in Afghanistan as we see it uh, falling into terrorist hands right now. We know that those people who are believers in the Lord Jesus who are in Afghanistan 
are going to come under persecution. And so the hope and prayer is that the lines of communication will still stay open so that we can somehow support them as they are going to go through struggle in Afghanistan. So that is how we show love as believers. We support one another. We don't divide. Um, so let's go on. And it just says here, verse three, and when I arrive, I will send those whom you credit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. So again, Paul wants nothing to do with it. He doesn't even want to be the one that picks the person to take the offering to Jerusalem. He wants them to say, this is the person we trust to take our offering. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Accompany me. So he'll go with them as they carry the offering, but um, he's not going to have any part in, in doing that. He wants to stay separate. So now we go into his plans for travel. Paul says, I will visit you after passing, passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that I may help, so that you may help me in my journey wherever I go. So he wants to visit them again. He wants to spend some time with them again. He loves the Corinthian church and he's longing to be with them. And so you see his heart here. Sometimes you think, you know, some of the other letters of Paul are so strong and so so bold you don't really see his human side but here to the to the letter of first corinthians which is full of love you're going to see that paul has this this affection this love for the corinthian church and he wants to visit with them after he does some other traveling to share the gospel uh, he says for in verse 7, For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. So he doesn't want it to be a quick visit. He wants to spend time with them. We learned um, in the first teaching that Paul, he spent the, the, the longest amount of time in his travels. He, he spent that time in Corinth. He just landed there, stayed there, and he obviously built great connections there. And he wants to be able to spend more time with them. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door of effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So he's going to come up against some adversaries in Ephesus, but God has obviously opened up a door, and he wants to go to Ephesus to share the gospel. So that's his desire to, to get work done for the Lord, but he still wants to come back to Corinth. Now verse 10. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let, let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. So here we have first mention of somebody who has been a um, uh, mentee of Paul. Many people know the name Timothy because Paul has written letters to him. So Timothy is somebody that, that Paul has risen up in the Lord and he trusts him and he's sending him to Corinth to be eyes and ears for him there and he's telling the people of Corinth to accept him and welcome him. No divisions, right? No problem that it's not him, Paul coming, there's somebody else coming, but welcome him the same way. Now, Timothy was quite young, so Paul wanted to make sure that he put in his letter that don't, you know, don't, don't despise him, don't hate him because of his youth. He's one of you, he's trusted by me, welcome him and treat him as you would treat Paul, is what he's saying. So we see Paul was very invested in raising people up in the Lord. Now I have a list of some other people here that you're gonna look for. You can see that Paul was, was really somebody who devoted a lot of his time to building up others so that they could go and serve as pastors to other places. I have here um, Ep Epaphras. You can see him spoken of in Colossians 4, 12 through 13. He, he was active in the Colossian church, in the church of Laodicea, in the church of Hierapolis. Then we have Tychicus. <laughs> sorry. Um, he was spoken of by Paul in Acts and Acts 20 verse 4 and Colossians 4 7 and also in uh oh I can't even read my own handwriting I 
gosh, I won't even I won't even share that verse because I can't read my own handwriting. Anyway, Tych Tychicus, he was somebody that Paul trusted. He he rose him up and he was sending him places to be a spokesman for the Lord and for Paul himself. And then we have Philemon and Archippus as well. They were uh, spoken about in Philemon uh, 1 and 2. And so you know that Paul had love for these other brothers in Christ, trust in them, no division. They were equally capable to share the gospel, to lead people, and he was sending them out. And um, this is something that we too are called to do as Christ followers. We're called to mentor others so that they can come up behind us and do the same work that we're doing. So my question to you is, do you have somebody, if you're a Christ follower, do you have somebody that you are raising up? Uh, some people would call it your second. Do you have somebody coming up behind you that you would trust to do the same kind of work that you're doing in the Lord? That is essential. We, we got to replicate ourselves so that we are um, able to share the gospel more and we're able to have people that we can point to and say, look, that is an imitator of me. Follow them. They know what they're talking about. And um, it's a loving thing to do to, to put time into finding somebody to mentor another believer that you would be able to point others to and say, look, they're, they're doing as I did follow them and there's no pride in it it's it's more uh, a wanting to share more of God's love through somebody who's been taught in the same way you've been taught so look for your second look for your person like Timothy was and these other men that I just spoke of that Paul had show your love by building a circle of people that you are mentoring and that you can pass the torch to to in the next the next season so that uh, leads us now to verse 12, which is labeled final instructions. So the final instructions to the first, uh, of first Corinthians to the Corinthian church. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has the opportunity. So now we have Apollos mentioned, same thing. Somebody Paul trusted to come, but he couldn't come at this time. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. So we saw early on in the letter how immature Paul felt that this Corinthian church was and the fact that they were dividing and the fact that they were allowing sexual immorality to happen among their ranks. So Paul is encouraging them, be like men, be strong in the Lord like men and do everything you do in love that idea of unity, no division, stand strong together in love to be a witness for the Lord. Now, if you turn to John and chapter 17, you are going to see that Jesus himself called us to do this. He was all about us being one, unity, so that what we did would represent the Father well. So in in John chapter 17, we have Jesus praying for the apostles before the crucifixion. And you can go to just John 17, 20, and let's just read 20 through 23. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. So that means for us. God is, uh, Jesus is asking this of the Father for everybody who's ever been taught by apostle, an apostle. That's us. He's asking this, that they may be, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, the glory that you have given me and I have given to them, that they may eat, be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. So Jesus himself is all about this idea of unity that people would come to believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, if the world sees that we are one. 
unified. The message of the gospel being held out as something that we do not waver from, that nobody divides over the way we do a mass or the way we do a baptism or the way we dress or the way we say you have to pray. None of that divisive stuff, none of that man-made stuff. All we need to do is unify on the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, came from God to earth to wipe away the sin of all of humanity and that anybody who would repent of their sin, turn to Jesus, uh, trusting in him by faith, that he would wipe away their sin. Anyone that believes that he died to wipe away their sin and then rose from the grave proving that, that their sin has been defeated, they will have eternal life in heaven with God the Father. If we unify on the message of the gospel, we lock arms hand in hand with those people, no matter what the denomination, who believe in that as their core. If the world sees that and doesn't see us in fighting, then the Father will be glorified and people will come to know him as the loving Father that he is, that would sacrifice his only son for the salvation of all humanity. So it's all about oneness and unity. And Paul is showing us as a, an example that we can imitate how to stay in fellowship, how to stay connected as one. And he does it by just listing out all these people that he has mentored and that he is sending all around who are sharing the gospel. And no, no, um, no jealousy, none of that. Paul knows that these men are doing great work, um, and, and women as well. He talks about uh, Priscilla, or P P P P P Priscilla, um, as well. And so this is all about oneness in the Lord. So uh, let's go on in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 15. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these, to, and to every fellow worker and laborer. So everybody is on mission for the same thing. Stay on track. And here we have another group of people mentioned that Paul has stayed in contact with, the household of Stephanus. He's saying be under authority to them, watch what they're doing, they're more mature than you. There we go. Verse 17, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortuitus and Achacus because they have made up for, for your absence. So he, he loves them too. He's saying, look, I love these guys. And you know, since I can't be with you, it's great that I can be with them. Love, it's all about loving the brothers. For they have refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. Recognize them. They're doing great work. No jealousy. No, they're better and we're better and none of that stuff. We're all on mission for the Lord. Same mission. Spread the gospel. Show love so people can see the Father's love for them. And it ends with verse uh, 19 through 24, a final greeting. The churches of Asia send you greetings, Achilla and Priscilla, or Prissa, together with the church in their house, send you a hearty greeting in the Lord. So you have a, a, a husband and wife team who have started a home church. He's worked alongside of them, sending you greeting. They love you too. They've been in Corinth, so they remember. They're saying hello. Uh, and look, there's a home church. So church can be in the home as long as you have an authority over you. Uh, Achilla and Persa, Priscilla or Persa, uh, had Paul as their authority. There needs to be a spiritual authority over you. You can't just spring up a home church and say, we're a church now. You have to be under authority, but there you go. Um, you, you can be a home church and all the brothers send you greetings, greet one another with a holy kiss. So Paul is in fellowship. He's got He's got all kinds of people that he's in connection with, and he's sending their love to the people in Corinth, and it's with a kiss. How much more can you show your love 
if not to give a kiss on the cheek when you see somebody, COVID or not COVID, that is love. <laughs> um, just to, to greet one another with a kiss. That's how you show you love somebody. And so it's all about loving the brethren, staying in that unified spirit of love. That's how we show the Father to a dying world who needs him, who, who need him badly. And verse 21, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember we had him in the uh, letters of First and Second Thessalonians. He was worried there were impossible, uh, imposters, false teachers. So Paul has learned he might have somebody write the letter for him, but he's going to sign it because he wants everybody to know his signature. Um, and that's his letter. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed, anathema. So if somebody does not love the Lord, they're not showing this spirit, then let them be accursed. Let them be cast aside, really. Paul doesn't have a lot of time for somebody who's not doing as he is instructed and being uh, showing love of the Lord in this way. And it says, our Lord come, at the end of that verse. That, those words, our Lord come, is Maranatha in the Greek. Our Lord come, it's, it's a plea. Come Lord Jesus, come now. It's also found, if you wanna turn there, as the second to last verse in the book of Revelation. It says in verse 20 of Revelation 22, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon, amen. Come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. It's a way that the early church would, would say goodbye to one another. It's something that I think that we should take up now, uh, considering how terribly things are turning, persecution, widespread, China, Iran, Afghanistan, all over the world. I'm sure it's coming to America very soon. We should take up that final goodbye to one another. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. He is the only one who will bring peace. God is going to bring pre peace to this earth. Now it, it starts with, unfortunately, destruction and a sword. But when Jesus returns to this earth in his second coming, that is what is going to usher in the millennial reign thousand years of peace. So if you want peace, you want Jesus. If you see what's happen happening in the Middle East and you say, what can we do? What you can do is turn your life over to Jesus and begin to pray every single day that he would come. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And the last verses of 1 Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. So Paul ends this book, bookended with love. It's all about love. And of course, many, many people know that because if they've been married, they might have had the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 read at their wedding. 1 Corinthians is all about love. It's all about unity. It's all about the love of Jesus. And so if you want to show the Father, then you want to show love. Starting first with the brethren, the brothers and sisters in Christ. No division, no jealousy. Somebody's got a ministry, you look at it, you say, oh, I wish I could do that. Don't do that. Support them, pray for them. If you see a ministry that needs help, give your offering, give some of your, your own goods to them, and uh, just love. Show love to one another, first to brethren, and then to others. And in that way, the world will come to know the Father, and they'll come to believe that the Father sent his son Jesus as a salvation of the entire world. Okay? I hope to see you next time. It's nice to have a little chapter about love in the time of really terrible terrible things going on on the earth all right we'll see you time uh, see you next time it's in jesus name i'm doing it all bye now